Hey everyone, it's Ivan, kitbadger.com, here to bring you part nine in the float tape series, picking up where we left off, this time over in the Arabian Sea, still on ship. All right, Cole, what's up? Sitting here watching Loomis kill bodies. Yeah. Uh, how's it feel, Loomis? Uh, it's not very comfortable. Yesterday was SA day. Here, give me a Armor. Armor. Watch. For those of you at home that can't see this, we'll do a little, uh, do a little fucking test. Press test. Press test. Of the armor here. What you can't see is that there's, there's a fucking round in here. Okay, ready? What? Watch. One more so I can get his face. It's still alive. That's about what that 40 pound plate can stop. The buttstock of a 16, anything bigger, you're in trouble. One of the other things of note was while out on ship, kind of in that same time frame, sitting in the Arabian Sea, we finally got our first issue of actual hard plates. We'd never touched them prior to this entire time in the Marine Corps. How do you feel leaving this barn? How do you, how do you feel uh, leaving the same barn? I feel safer not going. <laughs> but I'll feel bad because I won't be there when everyone else is uh, face down. Cute. Yeah. Lady signs, bro. It doesn't matter. It's all fucking. You're already see dead, the cat? right? See the cradle? That's all exactly. I gotta say. I can't remember the exact details, but my buddy is Spara and basically the whole first platoon as well as the attachment from weapons company, they got tasked with basically securing a helicopter. They ended up flying off ship over into Pakistan, I believe it was. They were off for, I forget exactly how long, but they were over there and eventually made their way back. No, they don't want to wear Excuse me. Our lieutenant's flag check. See if you can figure out which one it is. Oh, what do you know? It's shiny. Anybody have never dull? All right, honey, if I don't make it home, sorry, Lumis is fault. Let me keep the small, uh, the medium uh, trauma plate in instead of the large. Thanks. Hi, <laughs> Bert. Um, hey, turn around. Hey, turn around. Where's the other one?
I didn't realize it until I was going back through the tapes, but had someone come out and visit us on the Dubuque. Kind of a special guest. Granted, I probably didn't appreciate it at the time because it's one more reason I had to stand in formation, but Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Jones, as well as the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, Sergeant Major McMichael, came out and gave us a speech. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce you to the Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Jones. General, welcome aboard USS Dubuque. Thank you. Please stand with these. Sergeant Major. Captain Marines, Sailors. Ah! Great to be ah! with you. You're hard to find, but we found you. We uh, regrettably don't have uh, a lot of time. I would love to be able to talk to each and every one of you and uh, spend some time with you. But I'm here to uh, say a couple of things to you. But before I do that, I want to uh, introduce uh, someone who's very special to our Marine Corps and who's been doing a great job for these past two years. Easily the best decision I ever made uh, was selecting the 14th Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps. And so uh, without any uh, further introduction, you know who he is and you know how important he is to, uh, to our core, to our service, and uh, you know the great job that he's doing for each and every one of us. So let me introduce him to you and let him say a few words. Sergeant Major. Thank you, sir. It's always an honor and privilege to be introduced by the Commandant, but I will tell you that the greatest pride that I can have today is to be able to come out and say thank you to you, to you, the Marines and sailors that sail aboard the Dubuque, and all the wonderful things that you're doing to keep this great nation free and to let democracy ring throughout the world. Uh, let me tell you that tomorrow may be uncertain, and it may be not known what we're going to do in the future. But I can tell you one thing that is not has no has all the certainty in the world, and that is the Marines and sailors that build this premier. Expeditionary Force and Readiness is more than just ready. They're determined and they're willing. And those people that are willing and determined are you that stand on this deck this, this afternoon. So I'm very proud of you. I'm very proud of what you do. And I can tell you from the bottom of my heart that you have a nation that's very grateful for all that you have done and all that you will do to make sure that we stand and that our colors ring throughout, the, throughout this world. That we mean that no matter where you go or what you do, if you try to push bring oppression aboard uh, to this nation, you will answer because we will go in the, in the holes, we'll go in the tunnels, we'll go in the training areas, and we'll do anything it takes to make sure that everyone knows that we're not a second-class citizen to anyone anywhere in the world. I'm very proud to say that we are ready. We're ready because we have the things that it takes to be ready. We were ready long before the 11th of September because we knew that we had an infrastructure with our bases and stations throughout the world that we moved to make sure that they stood and had the things that they needed. Our training areas that allowed you to train and do the thing that you do, you did to come out here and be ready to answer the call. We have families that are back there that depend on you that also are respecting, expecting, have expectations of readiness, whether it's health care or pay or schooling or education. All of those things com combined represent the United States of America and represent you who's out here defending our great nation. So I say we, we're looking forward to being with you. It is an honor to be in your presence. It's an honor to be out here with the Commandant and let you know that we love you, we're concerned about you, and we're doing everything we can to make sure that you have what you need when you need it so that you can do what we expect you to do when we call on you. God bless you. Semper Fidelis and keep the Navy Marine team alive and let everyone know that we fly the red, white, and blue no matter how, how hot it gets, how long the hours of the day is, or how boring it may seem, we'll be ready to answer the call of this great nation. Take care of yourself, take care of each other, and continue to take care of this great naval service. God bless you. Seems like yesterday, but only 11 years ago, I was a new commander. 
I was the CEO of the 24th Mew. I took over the 24th Mew on the day that Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. Everybody thought we were going to immediately go to war. I, the Mew that I took over was just coming up, just had just come back and had about uh, four months to go before we deployed again. Everybody thought that we were going to accelerate our training and get over to the Persian Gulf and be there in time for the Desert Shield and Desert Storm. And so we trained, but nobody told us to mount out. The 2nd Marine Division mounted out, 4th Med mounted out. The reserves came to Camp Lejeune and trained, and they mounted out. And they kept telling us to train, and we'd be OK. A lot of our Marines in the 24th Mew thought, what the hell's going on here? Since there's a war going on, we should be a part of it. I did too. But they said, keep training. So we trained. We went through our Mu X, our SOC X. We trained with our Navy brothers. We embarked. We sailed across the Atlantic. Everybody was real excited. We got one day out from Gibraltar, and Desert Storm started. And as you know, it was over with very quickly. You could feel the disappointment with, a, with, a, with just by talking to people. We got into the Med. First couple of months were pretty slow. We were in Sardinia in March of 1990, 1991 now. And all of a sudden, we got an order to execute an emergency backload, proceed to the eastern part of the Mediterranean, report into a task force, uh, provide comfort, which nobody knew what it was about. We did that. We got there in about three or four days. I reported into a, an Air Force General and a Marine Brigadier General by the name of Zinni. And I said, what is it that we can do? He said, you can get up to the Iraqi-Turkish border about 500 miles from here, and you can start delivering uh, supplies to about a half a million refugees who are dying and freezing the rate of about 600 per day. And by the way, we're not sure what the Iraqi army is going to do. So we did that. We figured out a way. It was pretty, a little bit longer than USOX went. We offloaded the MSSG. We offloaded every swing and marine and the 24th Mew. We offloaded the SEALs. And we traversed the rugged countryside in Turkey. We got up there. And we were on the ground for four months, not only in Turkey, but actually in northern Iraq. We had a face down with the Iraqi army. We told them on our first day, it was 2nd Battalion, 8th Marines, landed, went up to the commanding officer and said, you've got 24 hours to be 30, cl 30 clicks from where you are right now. And for good measure, we ran fixed wing over their positions all night long without dropping anything. The next morning, they packed their trash, and they left. And so began the largest humanitarian relief operation the world had seen until that point. Now, the point of that story is simply to tell you that you all have experienced something quite similar, probably in your training. Only now you find yourself at the tip of the spear. You find yourself in a position that perhaps none of you ever dreamed of. Some of you hoped for, some of you maybe not hoped for, but you're here. You're trained, you're ready, you're part of a expeditionary task force, you are writing history, you're writing naval, naval history, both Navy and Marine Corps history, and you will continue to do that. September the 11th changed things. Prior to September the 11th, frankly, people like me and the CNO were working very hard to try to justify our budgets and our requests. We're very worried about the uh, decline in our shipbuilding capability. I was very worried, and I know the CNO was, about a ship, a Navy that was going to be less than 300 ships. There were people talking about uh, fewer than 12 arcs and biggest ready groups. We were struggling with how to pay for modernization and readiness at the same time. Um, unfortunately, in our country, sometimes it takes a tragedy to change things. And we sure had a big tragedy, and it sure changed things. And what it has changed is a new awareness 
for what it is you do, not what it is I do, what it is you do, what you stand for, and why you, why you are who you are, and why you're doing what you're doing. See, in this very unsettled world, which is probably more unsettled now than at any time in the past, the asymmetry of our threats is really what is most constant. Nobody is going to take us on face to face. Nobody's going to take us on conventionally. And so the only way they can do it is unconventionally or asymmetrically. And that's what that attack was all about. For many of us, that was the, the prime threat for, for a considerable number of years. I think it still remains that way. Now, how we respond to that threat, though, is also interesting because Frequently, conventional operations in the classic sense of building up huge forces takes time, it signals an intent. There's not much tactical surprise, let alone strategic surprise. And so, for the days and months uh, that face you and, and us and people like us, you're going to see, I think, the beginning of a, of a um, prolonged and sustained period of commitment on the part of the nation to root out this the evils of terrorism wherever they may exist. Not just in Afghanistan, not just in the Persian Gulf, not just in the Near East or the Middle East, but around the world. It's going to take a lot of patience, it's going to take coalitions, it's going to take all kinds of bridges that have to be built because we can't do this alone. Not, not in the inter international arena. But do it we must. And the folks, that, the people that are going to do it are people just like you. I, I can't imagine that any MUSOC or any ARG would ever sail for the foreseeable future thinking it's just going to be a pleasure cruise and there'll just be training exercises and it'll be simple. It will not be simple. And it will not be easy. But it's doable because of the people we have, the training we do, the capabilities we bring, the flexibility of being able to come over the horizon, strike quickly if required, and disappear over the horizon. Sometimes it'll be small targets, sometimes it'll be large targets. We don't know yet, but that, that will come. But this much is sure, this much is certain, that your mission, is to be ready. Your mission is to answer the nation's call. And your mission is to remember that who you are is extremely important to who we are as a nation. So I'm, I wanted to come here not to see kings and emirs, not to see heads of state, not to see chiefs of defense. I wanted to come here to see sailors and marines because I wanted to thank you and congratulate you for what all of you have done so far. And to tell you that hand in hand with whatever potential combat missions are out there, there will also be a serious and heavy logistical mission, sometimes a humanitarian mission. And even for those missions, we're admirably suited and equipped. Believe me, I know that firsthand because I participated in one for not six months, but an eight month deployment. And you know, at the end of those eight months, as we were finally leaving the Mediterranean and sailing home across the Atlantic, I made it a point to go to every single rifle company and every single organization in the 24th meter as we were going home after an eight-month deployment. And I asked them each a question. I asked them to be honest in the answer, but I said, it was a show of hands, I think. I said, we've been gone eight months. What if we had got a message that Saddam Hussein had come back into the to the uh, area that we worked in and started brutalizing the Kurds again. How many of you would volunteer to go back to do what needed to be done? And virtually almost 100% of all sailors and Marines raised their hands immediately and said they'd go back in a heartbeat. So it's that kind of commitment that it's going to take and it's that kind of dedication. You have what it takes, you will excel, you will prevail because you are part of the greatest Navy and Marine Corps team, I think, that's ever been built. The goal of people like me and the Sergeant Major is, is very simple. It's not about our legacy, but it's about leaving our service 
slightly better or than we than it was when we got there. Just moving that football about five to ten yards so that the next team can come in and move it even more. And I think today's Marine Corps and today's Navy, the partnership that we enjoy, uh, we're seeing times when that is going to happen. You're going to see it when you get back home. You're going to see it in your uh, readiness. You're going to see it in your modernization. You're going to see it in your housing. You're going to see it in your pay. You're going to see it in your allowances. You're going to see it because the nation is truly grateful. And for the next few years, you're going to see things that I didn't think I'd ever be around. I'd, I'd ever be around to see in terms of modernization, new technology, new capabilities, and the like. So. This is serious business. I don't mean to be somber, but it is serious business. You have people out there on the point, putting their necks on the line in the air and on the ground. You have other missions that may come your way, uh, but the good news is you don't have to worry about it because you're ready. Is that right? Yeah. You're ready because you're confident. You're ready because you're who you are. You're ready because you're good and you're ready because the only fear that you're really allowed to have is the fear of letting the nation down. And you, I know you'll never do that. So God bless you all. Thank you for uh, coming out here on deck on this, on this beautiful evening. Uh, thank you for sharing your time with us. And thank you for allowing us to come out here and uh, talk to you very briefly. I regret that we couldn't spend a, a good day or, or half a day with you to get to know each of, each of you a little bit more personally. But if there's anything that uh, any, any of us can do for you or take any messages home or, or the like, uh, please let us know before we leave ship. We'll be happy to do it. Captain, thank you for your hospitality. Marines, thank you for what you do for all of us. We're proud of you. Semper Fi. As far as I'm concerned, Sergeant Major McMichael failed in his duties of not teaching General Jones, who, in fairness to him, has kept up the tradition of Marines not knowing how to roll their sleeves. Come on, man, get with that. Make it happen. But at any rate, this wraps up part nine of Float Tape series. We'll pick up where we left off in part 10. And as always, thanks for joining us at kidbadger.com. Look forward to seeing you next time. Back down or a party.